seated. Let's go ahead and grab our Bibles or our phones and go to the fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews. Now, let me say as you go there, we have a lot of ground to cover. And, and, and uh, I may have mentioned there's so much in the book of Hebrews uh, that we could talk about that I had to just kind of get it down to as short as I possibly could make it. So we may go a little long. I apologize. But uh, I want us to look at what it means for the writer of Hebrews to say that Jesus is our great high priest. The writer of Hebrews calls Jesus our great high priest. And so when you leave here today, my prayer is that you will see that repentance is not something to fear, but something to embrace. But in order for that to happen, we need to go over a few definitions and facts first. And I know this is not an exciting way to start a sermon, uh, but we have a lot of ground to cover. So if you're watching online, stay with us. Don't go anywhere. I pray that this sermon would be used by the Holy Spirit to change someone's life. It may be someone in this room. It may be someone online. But if you lead or you tune me out, you're going to miss the blessing. And so I need you to focus today. I need you to tune in with me. So stick with me. Let's begin looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16, and then we'll get to some definitions. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testing we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will, we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it the most. In that very first line are the words great high priest. So the first thing we have to do is understand the organizational structure of the Jewish faith under the Old Covenant or the Old Testament. The nation of Israel was made up of 12 tribes. And they were the families that were descended from Jacob's sons and grandsons. And these are the 12 tribes. Reuben, Simeon, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Istafar, Zebulun, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. Those are the 12 tribes of Israel. There's actually one more tribe, and that is the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi. That's not listed in the 12 tribes of Israel because Levi is God's chosen tribe. The Levites were the tribe that was responsible for all the duties in the temple or the tabernacle. See, God's original intention for the whole nation of Israel, his intention was for them to be a kingdom of priests. But the Levites were the tribe responsible for officially carrying out all the priestly duties. Now the primary function of the Levitical priesthood was to maintain and assure as well as reestablish the holiness of the chosen people of God. And the priesthood was divided into three groups, the high priest, ordinary priest, and Levites. So anyone who worked in the temple who was not a priest, was called a Levite. While all priests were Levites, right? Not all Levites were priests. The Levites who weren't priests, they, I think we have a slide, Elijah. The Levites who weren't priests, they manned the temple gates, they cleaned the temple, slaughtered some of the sacrificial animals, and performed the music during temple worship. Now, above the Levites, we have just the ordinary priests. Again, they're all Levites, right? It's a little confusing. Everybody's a Levite, but then there's a special group called Levites in the te temple. All priests had to be a direct descendant of Aaron, the first official Jewish priest. The priests were only the only ones who could minister sacrifices at the altar. And then above priests, we had the high priest. He represented the height of the purity of of the priesthood. When he entered the sanctuary, he wore this breastplate that had the names of all 12 tribes of Israel on it. 
He was also the only one who could enter the Holy of Holies, but he could only do that one time of year to make an atonement for the sins of the entire nation. And so we have Levites, priests, and high priests. So here's what you need to remember. All priests had to be from the tribe of Levi. All priests had to be a direct descendant of Aaron. All priests could make the sacrifices for the people. Only priests could make the sacrifices for the people. Only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies. The high priest was intended to be the human representation of holiness. And only the high priest could make sacrifices for the atonement of the entire nation. Now we need to understand these requirements and duties in order to fully understand the magnitude of what the writer of Hebrews is saying here. See, the writer of Hebrews understood how powerful it would have been for the Israelites to read that Jesus had become their great high priest. But unfortunately for us, the magnitude of that statement has been lost over time. Right? We do not have high priests. Right? We did not grow up in that culture. So it would be easy for us just to skim past this passage without grasping the life-changing earth shattering news within it. Last week we talked about how God's grace never ends, right? But there is an end to his patience. And I, and I use the parents' relationship to their child as an example of God's grace and his patience, right? We know that the behavior of our children matters more to us than the behavior of other children, unless the behavior of other children affects our children, right? Now having mentioned that in my sermon, this past week I was thinking through some of the dumb things I have done in my life. And unfortunately, there are a lot of things to pick from. Um, but compared to a lot of kids, Mom and Dad, I was a really well-behaved kid. Yes, you were. And the reason was simple. I knew she was going to do it. I knew it. But the reason was simple. The reason I was a well-behaved kid was my dad. I had a very healthy fear of my father. He was very good about putting the fear of God into me. Now, he was a bit less effective with my brother, but I believed every word that came out of my dad's mouth when he told me what would happen if I misbehaved. Now, of course, it was never anything serious. I want you all to think that, right? The punishments were never over the top or horrible. But in my mind, no matter what the promised punishment was to be, to me it sounded like I was going to be strung up in the town square and stoned to death, right? I mean, as a kid, I was terrified of getting into trouble. It didn't stop me all the time, but I was terrified. It's why I behaved as much as I did. The scariest words in the English language to eight-year-old Jared were, wait until your father gets home. I hated those words. In my mind, those words meant, I hope you have enjoyed your time on earth because it's about to end, right? <laughs> now, again, the worst punishment I ever had was like one spanking. But I was convinced that if I got caught doing anything wrong, I would at best be thrown into general population at the Atlanta Penitentiary. Growing up, I always stood in awe as I watched my brother go and do crazy things without a care of the world. Meanwhile, I was afraid that if I crossed into another state without permission, I would get into serious trouble. I wish that was a lie, all right? When I was younger, I didn't think I could drive into Alabama without permission. I was so afraid of getting in trouble. Don't laugh at me. All right. But we don't like getting in trouble. I was, af I was afraid of getting in trouble with my dad, being judged by my dad and my mom. But it wasn't only the fear of being punished. I had the fear of being judged in any way. Right? Growing up, I assumed everyone was judging me. Everywhere I went... I just assumed that people had nothing better to do than to judge what I looked like, right? And so I would walk through the mall just very self-conscious, thinking that everybody's looking at me going, look at that dork, right? That's how I lived my life growing up. We all fear judgment from someone or some group. Now, maybe not to that degree, but we all have this fear of judgment at some level, right? I don't know too many teenagers who don't care what other, people's, other people think about them, right? Who is it at least a little fearful on their first day at a new school or a new job? I remember when I was in, in middle school, I got braces. And uh, I just assumed that once they put the braces on, that I wouldn't have to go back to school until they took the braces off, right? I didn't think I had to like go and like show them off to all my, my buddies, right? 
I knew what was going to happen as soon as I showed up at school with my braces. The day I had my braces put on was in the, I had them put on in the morning. And it finished in time for me to get to school in time for lunch. And so my mother took me to the school and dropped me off. And I had to walk into the cafeteria with all my friends there, knowing where I was earlier in the day. And as soon as I walked in, I, it felt like every, like the record scratch, you know, and everything froze and everyone looked at me. And my face turned beet red. Now, in reality, no one gave me that hard of a time. But I was convinced that as soon as I walked into that cafeteria, I would be judged. I would be laughed at. Because now I was a freak of nature with some braces, right? Let's be honest. We all fear the judgment of others in at least some small way. Right? No one likes to be rejected. No one likes to be judged. But it is a reality of life. However, if you grew up in the church, you heard about another judgment. That's the judgment of God. Growing up, there were often times when I had to choose between the judgment of God and the judgment of my peers. And more often than not, I, the judgment of my peers carried a lot more weight with me. After the last two sermons in the series, we know that, that God does indeed pass judgment on his people, right? God has no problem judging. In fact, God is the only one who is truly qualified to judge because God alone is holy. And when we die, we are going to have to give an account of our unholiness. Now, I don't know how often you think about stuff like this, but I want to take, want you to take a moment and just imagine something with me. Seriously, I want you to imagine this. Don't just sit there. Imagine you have just died and you're standing before God in all of his holiness. And then you realize that God and all of the angels and all the elders are looking past you to the wall behind you. And on that wall, they're playing a video showing a montage of all your sins on full display. God and everyone seeing who you were when nobody was around. Nothing is secret. Nothing is hidden. It is all there. Every single thing. Every sin. Now, I don't know how that makes you feel. But when I think about it, I get a little sick to my stomach. Right? When I think of my unholiness next to his holiness, I literally have a physical reaction. When I think of my unholiness and the fact that I am judged by the perfect and holy God, I am a little bit, uh, I'm, a, I'm a little more than intimidated. Look back at the passage from Hebrews. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus the Son... Let us hold firmly to what we believe. The high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testing we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. I want to show you how this fits into what we've been talking about up to this point. To better understand this passage, I, I want to take out the title, and Lord forgive me for rewriting the Bible right now, but I want to take out the title of Great High Priest, and I want to replace it with Great Defense Attorney, okay? So look at this with me. I'll just put it up there. All right, I want to read it again. So, that, so then, since we have a great defense attorney who has entered heaven, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe, this defense attorney of ours, understands our weaknesses for he faced all the same testing we did or we do and yet he did not sin so let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God there we'll receive mercy and grace see the passage is talking about a court proceeding the Jewish Christians reading this letter would have understood that that because the judgment of God or would have understood all this because the judgment of God was a prominent part of their religion and we've mentioned what the high priest does. But, but there is one job in particular that, that matters the most for us today. Because the high priest had a very unique job. The high priest functioned like a spiritual defense attorney who also sacrificed animals, right? I don't think regular defense attorneys do that anymore, but that's what they did, okay? The high priest was an intermediary between people and God. 
Think back to how Moses pleaded for God to forgive the Israelites. We talked about last week. Now, Moses was not a high priest, but his actions were the same. The high priest made sacrifices and pleaded for God to have mercy on his people. Essentially, they pleaded the guilty party's case. And for what it's worth, in that court, there is no presumed innocence. All right? We are guilty. We know it, and everyone else knows it. We are guilty. Guilty as sin. And so the high priest would offer sacrifices and intercessory prayer for the forgiveness of the sins of the people. Essentially, he stood in the gap between God and us. Here in the book of Hebrews, the writer says that Jesus is our great high priest. Now remember, the writer of Hebrews is trying to convince his or her readers why they should place their complete faith in this man, Jesus. And in the first chapter of Hebrews, the author makes the case for why Jesus is greater than all the angels. In the second chapter, the, 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 the author made the case for why Jesus is greater than Moses. Here, and elsewhere in the letter, the author is making the case for why Jesus is the great high priest. So what is that case? And if it's true that he is our great high priest, what does that mean for us today? To answer that, we need to first know the four qualifications of a high priest. And while I'm going to mention all four, we're going to spend most of our time on one of them in particular. Before we put these up there, remember, these are the qualifications of an earthly high priest. Earthly high priest. Put it up there, Elijah. Number one, he must be a man taken from among men by God. Now, for earthly high priests, the first part of this would have been a pretty low bar to meet. They had to be human, right? And a man. Sorry, ladies. They had to be a man. But besides being a man, they also had to have been chosen by God. There weren't any job fairs where you could hope to meet some people who work for the top high priest agency, right? You had to be chosen by God. They were appointed by God himself. The second thing, he must be able to be sympathetic to our weaknesses. We're going to come back to this one. That's where we're going to spend most of our time. But he must be sympathetic to our weaknesses. Number three, he needs to have a standing of holiness before God. For a pastor like myself to fulfill his or, whole, his or her role, he or she must remain as holy as possible. Now, I have not always lived up to that standard. All right? But that is the standard I'm called to live by. I'm supposed to be as holy as I can be in order to lead you to be holy. The same thing was true for the high priest. While no one is sinless, the high priest was expected to live a life where they never risk losing acceptance before God. This allowed him to be the mediator between God on behalf of the simple people. But again, no one was sinless. Therefore, even though he might have been holier than everyone else in town, he was still a fallen human being. In fact, the high, high priest had to offer sacrifices for himself as well as the people. And because of that, no human priest could do anything to fully pay the price for our sins. The number four, we've mentioned this, but he had to be a descendant of Aaron. Now, during Jesus' time on earth, the Jewish priesthood had a lot of power, both spiritually and politically. You may remember that the Jewish high priests were involved in the sentencing of Jesus to death. But all of that changed after Jesus' resurrection. Now there are no longer any high priests, and the Levitical priesthood has faded out. But... That's not the change I'm talking about. Everything changes. That's not what I'm talking about. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we live under the new covenant. Because of Jesus, we no longer need an earthly mediator between us and God. In fact, according to God's word, all Christians are now priests. And Jesus is the great high priest. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you, someone look at the person next to you and say, but you. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare his praises, the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. And by the way, that verse not only tells us we're all priests, 
but it also tells us what we're supposed to be doing as priests. We are a royal priesthood so that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of the darkness into the wonderful light in which we live today. That, folks, that church is what every single follower of Jesus Christ is supposed to be doing 24-7. We are to make declarations of praise to our God. That is our one responsibility. And unfortunately, many of us struggle to do the one thing we're supposed to do. Proclaim the good news in every aspect of our lives. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. Because I, I know I'm not perfect. And I'm not a perfect Christian. I fail to live up to that command way too often. I often proclaim the greatness of something else over the greatness of God. And it's not even on purpose, right? But if I'm not vigilant, I can easily fall back into praising something other than my God. And church, that's a sin. And I'm as guilty as anyone can possibly be. I have the blood of Jesus on my hands. My sin nails him to that cross. And as a father, I cannot begin to imagine what God the Father had to be feeling as he watched us torture and kill his only son. Even though the death of Jesus had to happen, the brutality of it had to make it infinitely worse for God the Father. As a father, I can't tell you what I would want to do to the person who hurt or killed my child. Let that sit for you. Let that sit with you for a moment. You and I, you and I, are the killers of this man, Jesus. Let that sink in. Think about it for a second. All of us have the blood of the Son of God on our hands. We killed the Son. You with me here? We have to understand this before we move on. Because if we don't grasp this, if we don't grasp the severity of this, then the good news is not as good to us. We don't understand it. It's still good news. We don't get it as fully as we should. We killed his son. How would you expect the father to view us? I mean, talk about ticking off the wrong person. We did the unthinkable. We murdered his son. What would you do? What would you do in that situation? Anything you can imagine doing to the person who hurt or killed your child pales in comparison to what God the Father can do to the people who murdered his son. See, when the Bible talks about the fear of the Lord, that fear is born out of the knowledge that we are depraved sinners and God is a God of holiness who holds our eternal future in the palm of his hand. It's not fear of a scary God. It's a respect for the character and the power of our God. That's why it can be so intimidating for us to deal with our sins. My mom said, just wait until your father gets home. It was a terrifying thing to hear. But it wasn't the most terrifying thing to hear. See, I heard the most terrifying thing once my father got home. The most terrifying thing was to hear, now Jared, tell your father what you did. That was one thing for my father to know what I did, but I didn't want to be the person to tell him, right? It, it, was, it was better for someone else to do it. I'll take the blame, but don't make me say it. I don't want to admit what I've done. Now imagine having to do that with God. I fear doing that with my earthly father, and he isn't perfect. He has sin in his life like everybody else. But my Heavenly Father is perfect. My Heavenly Father hates sin. 
The writer of Hebrews understood that many who read the letter would recoil in fear at the thought of having to stand before the all-holy God and admit their sins. Some of you know that fear. Some of you are living in that fear today. It's a fear that keeps a lot of people away from God. As a person, as a pastor, I know how fear keeps people from confessing and repenting of their sins. I have not only felt that fear, but I've also allowed that fear to keep me from confessing my sins. Right? I was terrified of people finding out. But I've also been terrified of going to God in my sins. See, I can intellectually know that my sins can be forgiven. Like, I intellectually know that. However, so often my intellect is held hostage by my emotions. I don't want to admit it. I don't want to talk about it. I just want it to go away. Right? If I, if I, can, just, if I can just put my head down and plow forward, eventually it won't matter anymore. Right? I mean, time diminishes, uh, diminishes that, that dirty, dirty feeling we had. Yeah, we felt really dirty when we did it. But now that time has passed, I don't feel as dirty. But we also believe that the lie, we also believe the lie that time will make everything better. Now, while time can heal some things, time, hear this, time will never heal the separation between you and God caused by your sins. While not dealing with our sin has many effects, one of them is that our unwillingness to confess our sins to God holds us back from being and doing all that we are created to be and do. While we think time has healed our, our, the wounds of our sins, the reality is we're just assuming that when we are, we're assuming that where we are currently is where we would have been regardless. So really, the sin didn't really matter that much, did it? But the reality is, church, sin alters our lives in ways we can see and in ways we may never see. Every sin pushes us a little more off the course we're supposed to be on. However, without God's perspective, we can't see it. And what we risk ha have happening is we, we risk being stuck. We become stuck. We are held back by the weight of our sins. We can't grow in our faith like we should. We can't be the father or the mother or the son or the daughter we're supposed to be. We can't be the Christian we should be. All because of the weight of unconfessed sin. This is why Jesus being our great high priest matters. Hear me. Jesus is the great high priest, the ultimate, the last, the only one that will ever be needed from here on out. As we've discussed, part of the high priest's duties was continuously sacrificing animals on behalf of himself and the people. The problem was, right, the system could never totally satisfy the wrath of God. But now, no other sacrificial lamb is needed. Jesus has paid the price of our sins in full. When Jesus cried out on the cross, it is finished, he was announcing to the seen and unseen world that his defeat over sin and death is now complete. And so, since his defeat, or his defeat was complete, he could step into his role as our uh, great high priest. And his reign as our great high priest will never end. His priesthood will never end because his sacrifice was perfect. And there's one very cool thing that our great high priest does for us. Look back in verse 4. Now remember, the earthly priest was an intermediary between the people and God. Now, that intermediary is Jesus Christ himself. There are a lot of reasons someone might call me. Maybe they need some advice. Maybe they need some prayer. Maybe they need to know the correct opinion on a particular movie. There are multiple reasons for someone to call me. But there are a lot, of, a lot more reasons for people not to call me, right? As of right now, no one has ever called me to ask how I would handle a billion-dollar business merger. Because I have no clue, right? I mean, if I had to guess, I'd say the first rule is to be extremely careful, right? After that, I got nothing. 
right? I've never done that. No one is going to call me to ask how to replace the flux capacitor in their car. That's back to the future, isn't it? Okay. Well, that proves my point. All right. But people have called me to talk about addiction. People have called me to talk about broken marriages. People have called me to talk about the death of a loved one. Why? Because I'm an addict. Because I had a broken marriage. Because I have suffered the death of a loved one way too many times in my life. I have walked that road. I can relate to what they're going through and how difficult it is. Do you remember the second qualification of a high priest? He must be able to be sympathetic to our weaknesses. This church is the one that truly changes everything for us. Remember, Jesus is the intermediary now between us and God. Right? But here, it does beg the question. How can Jesus be sympathetic to our weaknesses if Jesus never sinned? How can Jesus know what it's like to be us if he's never sinned? Pay close attention to what the writer of Hebrews wrote. The high, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testing we do. Yet he did not sin. I want to read that again. Listen. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So maybe, just maybe, sinning, isn't what is needed in order to be sympathetic to our weaknesses. It seems based on that that the testing is the important part. Now it would be easy to think that since Jesus was the Son of God, God in the flesh, and he had a pretty big unfair advantage over all of us, right? I mean, he's God, of course. It's going to be easy for him not to sin. However, that argument does not work. C.S. Lewis points out that would be like a child objecting to have an adult teaching him how to write because, well, it's easy for grown-ups. It's like a drowning man protesting that the person saving him has the unfair advantage because, well, he's in a boat. Jesus being God in the flesh does not keep him from being able to experience what it's like to be human. And the second reason we can't say Jesus had an unfair advantage is because we don't fully understand what it means to be human, church. See, authentic humanity should not be gauged by our present fallen condition. Because true humanity is human life lived in the image of God. You see, Jesus is the perfect human. Jesus is the human that you and I are supposed to be. He's the human that Adam and Eve were in the garden. Therefore, it is not Jesus who doesn't understand what it feels like to be human. It is you and I who do not understand what it feels like to be human. And the reason we can't say Jesus had an unfair advantage is because we do not really understand temptation. We read the story of Jesus being tempted in the desert and how he resisted Satan and temptation. It's easy, it's easy for us to think, well, of course he did. He's God. If I was God, I could resist every temptation too. The problem is we don't understand the proper role of temptation. Hear this, church. You need to understand this. Temptation does not create Moral excellence. Temptation proves it. Think of it like the testing of metals. If it is really gold that is being tested, then there is no actual possibility that the test will reveal anything other than genuine gold. And yet, the test is no less arduous. See, the temptation in Jesus' life tested him as much as it tests us. Now, he's at God's right hand, acting as our defense attorney. But he's not just some court-appointed defense attorney who doesn't even know our name. No, 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 no. This intermediary not only knows everything about us, but he knows what it's like to be us. That is the game changer. Jesus, the Son of God himself, is interceding on your behalf. So that you and I can be forgiven of our sins. No matter the sin. Whether it's stealing paper clips from the office. Yes, that's a sin. Or cheating on your spouse. Your sin can be forgiven. Amen. But instead of receiving that gift. You cower in fear. 
You don't want to admit it. You don't want to deal with it. And so it eats at you. The unconfessed sin in your life has changed you, and you know it. You don't have as much patience as you used to. You get frustrated more quickly. You aren't as happy as you used to be. You can't eat. You can't sleep. You withdraw. It makes you physically sick. Unconfessed sin can lead to all of those or just some of those. But whether you experience just one or more of those byproducts, the reality is you are being held back. You are not who you were created to be. Satan is using your fear of dealing with your sin to keep you from growing more mature in your faith. And that not only affects you, it affects everyone you come in contact with. That unconfessed sin is hurting you and your family. But the good news is there's Jesus Christ. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore he is able once and forever. Hear this. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. Hear that last part. He lives forever to do what? Intercede. Go back to our main scripture reading. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This, great, this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Now, hear this part. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There, there, at the throne, we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. See, when I was a child, and I got hurt, which was often... Uh, I knew without any doubt whatsoever I could run to my mommy and she would make it all better. Right? The lack of hesitation to go to the one who could fix it is what we're talking about here. Right? While our sin damages our lives, while our sin damages our marriages, our, our parenting, our friendships, our opinion of ourselves, our opinion of others, or we're allowing sin to destroy us, Jesus is in heaven going, hey, come on. Let's deal with this stuff so you get back to living in my joy. Let's rip the band-aid off and just deal with it. The writer of Hebrews says uh, we should come boldly to the throne. That means don't crawl. Don't try to sneak in. Run. Run to the throne of God and confess your sins. Be forgiven and then go and sin no more. While we want to run from confession, Jesus wants us to run to confession. Why? Because Jesus knows better than anyone how sin robs us of our true humanity. And even better, he's the one standing in our place before the Father and making the forgiveness of our sins even possible. So why are you holding on to the unconfessed sin? Why are you afraid to confess it? Why are you choosing the less instead of embracing the greater? Hear me. No one is holding you back but you. Your husband, your wife, your kids, they're not holding you back. It's you. You alone can confess your sins. You alone can repent of your sins. And until you do, you will continue to suffer the <laughs> weight of that sin. You will continue to be held back in your faith. Jesus is saying, run to the altar. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. I am here with you. And more importantly, I am here for you. So run and be forgiven. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Do you see where the mercy and the grace are found? Only at the throne of God. That's the only place you're going to find mercy and grace. So does anyone need to do some running today? Are you ready to run to the altar and be set free today? That unconfessed sin may have been there for 20 years. And the Holy Spirit is bubbling it up right now. And you're thinking about it. That's the Holy Spirit saying, let's deal with this today. No more. 
You're not carrying us out this door. This is not going to hurt you any longer. We're going to deal with it today once and for all. He invites you into the throne room not to condemn you, but to set you free. To set you free. Do you want to be free from all that sin? Then will you run to the altar? I'm going to pray. And the invitation is simple. This altar is open. We're going to sing the song, The Throne Room. We're going to the throne room, church. If you need to confess uh, unconfessed sins, or you need to pray about anything else, this altar is open. Don't leave your church carrying that sin with you anymore. You're wasting your time. Get over it here and then be able to move on. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you that you sent your Son into the world not to condemn us, but to save us. But Lord, you know how much we don't deserve it. We sin and we sin and we sin. And yet, Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are now our great high priest and you are standing between us and God the Father. And you're you're saying, okay, God, yeah, I know. They they said, Jared's a good guy. So let's forgive him. He asked for forgiveness. We can forgive him. And then we're forgiven. And God forgets the sin. It's like it never happened. But Lord, you know how often we just carry on that carry that sin around with us. Like we know intellectually we can bring it to you, but it's just too painful. We know that if we come to the altar and start talking about this, and we're going to start crying, and, and, and our nose may start running, and then we're going to be embarrassed. But Lord, Holy Spirit, break us today of our pride. Let us finally, once and for all, deal with the thing we have not dealt with. No matter how painful it might be. So Holy Spirit, draw us now. Draw us now to the altar, to the throne of our Heavenly Father so that we can be forgiven. Pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand and I invite you to come.